What's going on everybody? I'm Max the Catfish and this is part six of our Stellaris Beginners tutorial focusing on diplomacy and other alien species out in the galaxy. I said in the last episode that I was going to skip ahead and meet other uh, aliens first before showing you this, but I have a sense that we've got an alien species very close to us and so we're just going to jump right into it and show you what a little bit of that gameplay looks like leading up to those moments. So. I'm going to start from where we left off and build a couple of mining stations. I've got a couple of things that we have to catch up on in terms of our empire because we were playing the game like you know you would if you were showing a tutorial, not exactly like you would if you were actually playing. I'm gonna catch up on some tech here and grab the coil gun tech because I haven't grabbed a lot of uh, offensive or defensive technologies yet. And I'm also going to speed up the game a little bit so that this happens a little bit faster. Now, we've got an encounter here on Feynov, look at that. And this is an encounter with an alien species, but you'll notice if we if we zoom in on the system, this is not like the mining vessels we encountered. This, in fact, is an alien science vessel that is racing us to survey the system. Remember, in order to take new systems, you have to survey them first and then grab them with your construction vessels. And that's exactly what's happening here with this other alien species. So we know this is another alien empire, just like our empire here, our little crescent, croissant shaped empire, right? So I am going to actually cancel this action and I'm gonna bring my construction ship to grab Sugalia because I don't want other aliens to have access to our space. In fact, Feynov is a really valuable system because you'll notice that it is also a choke point between these two systems, likely systems that connect to the rest of the galaxy. If I take a look at this star system here and the positioning of it, I've got a pretty good sense that this is a cluster, right? There are no ways in or out of any of these stars in this system and in this cluster here, except for this choke point, which is what makes this incredibly, incredibly valuable for us to defend. So I'm going to grab our uh, construction vessel, definitely grab Sugalia. And then as soon as I possibly can, we're going to grab Feynov. Now, the other thing I want to do is I want to establish first contact with this alien species so we can actually engage in some diplomacy with them. And I can do that just like we did with our ancient mining vessels on the other side of our um, of our empire by assigning an envoy for first contact. And that just takes a little bit of time for us to build up that first contact with them. Remember, in the last episode, we went in the policies tab and one of the last things we did was we set our first contact protocol to proactive, which is gonna give us a little bit more influence to use on creating new uh, star bases, gathering new things under our empire, and also some diplomatic elements in the game as well. We were previously, I think, at cautious, which you'll notice the last bullet point of that says, negative first contact events are less likely to, ha to happen to us. So by switching from cautious to proactive, we've actually Put ourselves at a little bit of a risk here depending on who we're up against and what these alien species want what their ethics are and how they conflict perhaps with our own ethics which i'll explain once we meet them so we're gonna grab sugalia and while we wait for our science vessel to research this i just saw something change here i was about to finish a sentence but i think they may have brought in a construction vessel to build in this system. We may be able to beat them to Feynov, we may not. So I'm actually gonna cancel this again, head over to Feynov. We may have lost this to this alien species. Oh no, it's actually, it's a, another science vessel of theirs. They swapped out their science vessels for some reason. I'm gonna be very proactive about this because I think Feynov is gonna be a very important system. And I'm just gonna sit here and wait until the surveying is complete from our survey vessel. In fact, we only have, I think one, two, three more planets for us to survey. It's happening very fast because we're on fastest speed. And once this is done, the moment it's finished, there it is, I'm gonna have our construction vessel build a star base here. And because our construction vessel was already in the system, already located over the sun, we are able to start construction of that, of that star base very, very quickly. This is a strategic decision that you might make in a couple of cases where we are foregoing the gathering of resources in the short term for the security of our empire in the long term, which is the most important for you to consider, right? 
Now, our science vessel jumped into Yakuri, and I can see immediately what's happening. Phenov was a really good choice. I'm really glad that we grabbed that because in the center of this system, even though we can't tell what it is, we can't tell who owns it, I can tell you right now, this is a starbase. And so what, uh, whatever alien empire exists in this portion of space, they own this system. And even if I survey it, I can't take my construction vessel to come in here and, and build it. A, Little bit of a tip for how this, you know, how you might find out what these systems are is if you use a construction vessel to right click, whether you've surveyed it or not. If you scroll over build mining stations, you'll see system is not within our borders. And that lets you know that that system is owned by another empire. So in the meantime, I'm gonna build up some mining stations here. And just in case, because this is the brand new sort of forward operating post for our empire, I'm going to build our star base into a star port. This allows us those options to build up a really nice defensive position like we did at the end of our last, uh, wow, pop-ups galore. And boy, I'm glad we're doing this uh, like we did on our last episode with Asterion, right? We built this into a star base as a defensive position for this choke point. Now we have a forward defensive position that's built building up. We're going to build it from a star base into a star port. And because we're doing that, I'm gonna turn this into our main shipyard where we're going to build a bunch of ships. Now, oh boy, we got something big. And, and while you're going to be bombarded by pop-ups in this game, the ones that you should pay the most attention to are the ones you've never seen before. Our explorers knew first contact to be a dangerous affair, but none could have predicted how true this would be. In a violent assault, the frogs, as we're calling them, seized our vessel, landing a boarding party before our emergency FTL could be engaged. And despite their valiant efforts, they were able to overwhelm our defenses. Now, perhaps fortunately for both them and the sake of keeping information on our enemy hands, our crew took their own lives rather than permit themselves to be captured. This is a pop-up that is happening as part of the first contact protocols. They are researching us just as we are researching them. And it's a bit of a race to see who can research whom the fastest. Now, they probably have an aggressive research stance, which is why they were able to attack and destroy our science vessel. Fascinating, interesting. We've got to click on that icon in order to pro uh, progress the frogs event. And this is going to continue until we found out who this species is, but we know that they're hostile. And this probably leads us to believe that our first encounter with alien life is going to be an aggressive alien who wants to do us harm. With that in mind, we've got a couple things we should probably do. Uh, I'm going to kind of ignore some of these other events here. Uh, if we take a look at our traditions panel, we had chosen the diplomacy tradition because we were hoping to make friends with aliens in space. We might still be able to do that despite the fact that we are up against a hostile alien species, but you know, you, you never know. If I were not in tutorial mode, I would probably tell you to switch. I would probably say, uh, choose a new tradition, probably take supremacy, which is a very aggressive tradition that benefits attacking enemies. There is also another tradition I don't see in here which must come from a DLC, uh, which is called Unyielding, which allows you to have a very defensive position where it improves your star bases, your star ports, the effectiveness of your defensive armies, and those kind of things. I believe that comes in a DLC. I'll see if I can get the information on which one that is. I'll put it in the description down below. But uh, I would probably tell you, especially if you have no DLCs right now, to grab the Supremacy uh, sorry, uh, yeah, the, no DLCs, to grab the Supremacy Tradition because it gives you stuff like ship fire rate increases and the reduction of your ship upkeep. So your ships cost you less to keep around as a standing Navy. Probably a good idea to grab this, but let's just say I'm, I'm a little bit stubborn and I'm hoping that this is an alien species that we could actually engage in diplomacy with. So I'm going to take the Federation ability. This allows us to actually create a Federation of multiple empires with other aliens in the galaxy, if they'll have us. I don't know if this one will because it's aggressive. We'll find out. So our uh, science vessel unfortunately was destroyed. I've got a backup science vessel here sitting waiting for work. So we are going to go ahead and survey the rest of the systems 
in this star cluster. And from what I can see, you'll notice that as our science vessels move closer and closer to different stars, we can see the hyperlanes of those stars uh, kind of forming. But you'll always be able to tell whether a system connects to others by just taking a look at it, rotating the camera with the right mouse button and seeing whether there are any hyperlanes that are connecting out to star systems nearby. I can see that this one's a dead end and this one's a dead end, which means I was right. This is a star cluster that is completely contained and Feynov is going to be our kind of final hope for our empire. It's going to be the front lines of a potential conflict with other empires in the galaxy. What that means is I might want to build Feynov up into a good defensive position. And I don't just do that by building a star base, which I'm creating now, a star port, but I also do that by building a planet that will be able to defend against potential alien incursions. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and colonize this planet, build a colony ship like we have before. And it's actually not a bad planet at all. It's a little bit small, but it's got a good amount of generator districts on it, which would make it a great uh, energy generation planet. We've got a couple of other planets around here that we might want to do. A Sterion included because this is on our choke point. I'm going to go ahead and colonize this one as well. And you know, I've played the game for several hundred hours. I know what I'm doing here, but if you are just starting off in your first couple of games of Solaris, I would recommend you very slowly colonizing planets. Don't do it very quickly because the more planets you colonize, the higher of a income cost those planets have for food, for energy credits. These things can spiral really quickly out of control and they can get really scary and hard to manage. So just keep that in mind. But let's grab planetary unification. It's a great technology in the society tree. One of the very first that you should grab. And we've got our starport now built on Feynov. Now, I'm assuming, because this is a hostile empire, that we are going to need some defensive positions here. And there's two ways that you can do this. The first is you can build up modules, which place a little, like a small gun uh, defensive platform on it that can shoot down your opponents. Uh, the other way is by creating defensive platforms, which are these, um, let me go into the ship designer here, which are these platforms that will be built around your star base that are used to defend your star base even more. Think of them like static, non-mobile ships, but much more powerful than your Corvettes. I'm gonna get into this in our next episode, but you'll notice that Corvettes only have three guns that can be equipped on them, while defense platforms have a potential for a lot more guns. In fact, if we just compare small weaponry to small weaponry, uh, they have almost three times as many gun platforms as a Corvette does. We're gonna get into ship design soon. It will happen in the next episode when we talk about warfare, but keep that in mind that defensive platforms are really, really, really good to build, especially if you're feeling pretty confident that you are going to need to defend incursions into your own space. So I'm gonna build up a defensive platform here. I'm lacking alloys to build up more. So what I'm gonna do, because I'm a little bit, feel a little bit cautious here, plus we've got some planets that need it. I'm going to build up a couple of uh, avenues for us to gain more alloys for warfare. The first is I'm gonna build some industrial districts on this planet. Not only are we out of housing and jobs, but we've got some unemployment. So let's definitely get that. And then we've got our first building slot, which I'm going to dedicate to the alloy foundries where these work just like your industrial districts do. People turn minerals into alloys. Always good to have, great for gearing up for war. On Alpha Centauri, this is our generator district. I'm just gonna build up two more generator districts here as well. And while I said that it's important for you to specialize your planets, and it is, we've got an option here. We could choose to build another alloy foundries here and turn our plentiful income of minerals into an income of alloys, but our amenities are looking a little bit low. So I am looking for something like the commercial zones, which would produce some trade values and amenities for our population, or the hollow theaters, which turn consumer goods into unity and amenities. A couple different options of how you could do this. You've got a little bit of flexibility here. You'll notice that the amount of amenities that you gain from these two are vastly different. The hollow theaters will give you a total of 20 amenities if you fill those two jobs. And the commercial zones will only give you a total of six amenities, which is, you know, pretty low. 
but in the short term, maybe what you're looking for, right? These two are very similar, but, but a little bit different. This one produces trade value, which gives you energy or other resources. This one consumes consumer goods and it generates unity in return. I'm gonna take the hollow theaters, but it's kind of a toss up between these two, honestly, at this point. Uh, it's, your, it's your choice, what you'd like. There's another option and a bunch of different options in here, the luxury residences, instead of creating jobs at all, they just create housing and give you a flat five amenities. It's actually not bad. That kind of fixes the problem in the short term. It's up to you to choose which of those you'd like to, to have on your planets and you get to mix and match that in your game. On Earth as well, I'm going to build up a alloy foundries. And you know what? No, nope, bad idea. We've got negative seven amenities here. That may be, oh, it's just because our population is growing so quickly. I'm definitely going to build up a hollow theaters on our main planet because that's going to fix the issue very quickly. All right. So let's just let time run its course. Eventually we are going to find out who that empire is and what they want with us, but that's just something that's going to take a little bit of time. Now let's talk about elections because you may face this in your gameplay, depending on how your empire is run. Elections are typically out of your hands, but you can do something which is called supporting a candidate. And by supporting a candidate, you as sort of your, your empire's maybe spiritual, maybe more tactical leader, you are choosing to throw your support behind one of these people. And in so doing, you can encourage the promotion of that person to president or to the whatever the role is of the leader of your empire. Different empire ethics are going to determine what this process looks like. And for a democratic or an oligarchic empire, it looks like your population will try to elect this person fairly, but you can always step in. This costs a little bit of unity because if you think about it, you are basically sort of defying the election standards of a democratic you know, population by, by supporting somebody. But if you take a look at the traits of this uh, of these leaders. This leader is going to affect your entire empire. It's across your every single system, every single planet. And just like your leaders, this uh, this kind of uber leader, right, is uh, has their own traits. So we've got a plus 10 unity and some edicts. So this is a very edict focused leader. And then the second one it also has the edicts, but has a starbase module and upgrade cost reduction which may actually be sort of valuable for us because we want to build up our star bases in, in preparation for defending our territory. So if I choose Henry LaRue, you'll notice that uh, he's got 44% of the support of the factions right now in our empire, and I choose support. That is going to bump up his chances of being elected. It won't necessarily make him the leader. In fact, in this case, it didn't. Uh, uh, Ilya, in fact, had the most support of, of anyone there and my support was not enough to elect them. But it could be the difference between getting a leader who's very strong in this position for the moment that you need them or not. Most elections, you probably don't care about this. Like you probably don't have to spend the, the unity. You probably don't have to support a, uh, a leader, but you consider that as one of your tools in your back pocket in case you need that for your specific playthrough. Cool. So that's going on. One of our physics researchers has just died. So we've got to replace them with a new researcher. I'm going to grab this maniacal researcher here with 5% increased research speed. And I think we've queued this up to build these systems here. The other thing I'm going to do in preparation for war, kind of good that we have a little bit of a stockpile, is I'm going to buy alloys on the market. We haven't looked at the market yet, but if you click on any of the icons up here at the top, it opens up the market. Now, there are two markets in the game, the internal market and the galactic market. The internal market is this element of the game that allows you to trade one resource for another, but it is purely based on the trades that you make. Just like the supply and demand curves work in real life, if you have a gigantic supply of energy, but you have very little minerals, minerals are gonna be worth a lot of money. 
And so as you trade resources between your energy credits, which you use for currency, and the other resources in the game, the cost and the value of those resources will increase and decrease on the internal market. So as I buy, if I just use it as, as an example, 25 alloys, I just purchased 25 alloys. The supply of alloys has gone down. The apparent demand of alloys has increased. And as such, the price of alloys has increased as well. So purchasing small amounts of a resource will see that number kind of increase steadily as you go. Uh, just keep that in mind if you're on the market buying and selling items. We've got actually an excess of consumer goods. And you know, consumer goods aren't worth that much right now, but I could sell 500 of our 1,900 and I could get 600 energy back. And you might consider coming to this screen. If you are running into some issues with balancing your economy, you can balance it in the short term. I'm not gonna go too far into this, but one thing that you can do, if you find out that you just have a bunch of planets that are really good at producing only one resource, you can come to the automatic trades section and buy and sell resources automatically on the internal or galactic markets every month. And you can use this as a tool to balance your economy in the short or the long term. Just remember that you've done this because I've run into situations where I've created monthly trades and then years later go, what the heck? I'm, I'm bleeding minerals, but I'm producing so many, what's going on? And it turned out I had created a monthly trade to sell off minerals for months and months and months and months. And all of my minerals are gone because of that. So that is the market. It's a very, very valuable place for you to go to, especially in times when your economy is a little bit uh, tumultuous, let's say. Now, it's happened. Our first contact with the frogs has been aborted because they were able to research us before we were able to research them, which is fine. Uh, you know, that happens sometimes, but just keep that in mind that other alien species are trying to find out about you just as much as you are trying to find out about them. And we've established communications with our very first actual empire. This is an empire of a sapient species that is running its empire just as we are. First things first, when we look at this, when we look at the upper left-hand corner and we wanna learn a little bit about who these people are, we can take a really quick look at their civics and we can see that they are an authoritarian and fanatic xenophobic species. What that means is they hate other species. They believe that they are the purest, most beautiful form of any species in the galaxy. And what this typically means is that they are going to be aggressive. They are going to start early wars. They are going to start early incursions on their neighbors. They are going to try to crush any oppression whatsoever and oppose anyone else. Now, what makes this so interesting and, and is very important for you to understand is if we take a look at our own ethics, we are actually almost the mere opposite to this species. Almost exactly. Authoritarian and egalitarian are opposites on the ethical uh, grid there, right? Remember the, when we were taking a look at um, species creation, they are almost exact opposites of each other. And xenophilic and xenophobic are exact opposites of each other on the ethical wheel, which is not good because there is no chance in this game that we will be friends. We are fundamentally different empires. Now, I will say, you can challenge that. You can actually come up with some schemes to change the internal ethics of your neighbors. It's not very easy to do. It's not something that is very quick to do either. So it takes a lot longer than most other ways of dealing with people like this, say warfare. But uh, keep in mind that when you meet new alien species, the likelihood of you being friends with them is increased if your ethics align and ours do not. They are exact polar opposites. This will be an enemy for the entire our entire existence, really. And so we have to do something about that. When you first meet a new species, you have the option to choose one of three responses. And these responses have really quick tool tips in them that explain what they're all about, right? Uh, the, the very friendly one 
makes their opinion of you increase by a little bit. An opinion is important because it's what determines whether an alien species is likely to go to war with you or likely to send you diplomatic insults or likely to take aggressive actions against you in various ways. The middle bound way protects us a little bit and gives us a little bit of resistance against potential attacks from their spies. And that's usually a pretty good way to go. No harm, you know, but also no benefit really, except for the protection of, of our empire. And the more aggressive way allows us to prepare for hostilities with this empire. And this gives them a much lower opinion of us, which I don't usually recommend unless you are really, really, really powerful at that moment. Because reducing opinion allows those kind of events in the game, like an empire coming to war with you, to, to happen much sooner. I'm gonna choose the middle bound way for meeting our empire, our, our new empire. And uh, we got a little icon there that says it's a momentous occasion for our species. It certainly is. It's also quite, it's also quite scary. Once that happens, you'll notice that we can see a couple of things show up on the galaxy view. And these things show up depending on how zoomed in you are. But we can see this text, which is the name of the empire. And if we scroll in one more click, we can see that they have one system here, but you'll notice this brown border that is encompassing uh, a bunch of systems. That is the size of their empire. So we know for a fact they own most of the systems that kind of dot these stars around here. They might even own this system here. It looks like they've got a pretty big empire size. And based on the positioning of their, uh, their logo and their name, you can see about how much space they take up. Just like ours is centered pretty well-ish in our empire, theirs is centered pretty well-ish and close to their, uh, their capital. Now, if we click on their capital, it brings up the negotiation and diplomacy pain for us. And this is where we engage in many of the elements of, of figuring out who's out there in space and what's up with them and how do we, how do we work with them, right? First off, we took a look at their ethics already, but we don't know much about their civics or anything about their fleet power, their technology level, or their economy. We've only just met them, but we want to find out a little bit more about them, right? Do they have a big fleet? Are they technologically advanced compared to us? Do they have a strong economy that will allow them to support themselves in war for a long period of time? We're not quite sure yet, but we can find those things out with a couple of different methods that we have at our arsenal. Similarly, we can see up here that their attitude towards us is hostile. And what that means is they would love to attack us if they think that they can beat us. Now, sometimes you can get to the point where your attitude is so poor with another empire, they will just go to war with you just to do whatever they possibly can to take you down. But at this point, if they think that they can win in a war against us, they are going to declare war against us. And so we definitely want to make sure that our defenses are, are up to snuff, right? To prepare for that. We can see a couple of different traits and some elements of what's happening right now in this little panel here. They have uh, this these kind of relationships with other empires in the galaxy, right? But with us, they are actively trying to harm relations. And there's actually both a mechanical and a strategic you know, reason to do this, which we'll see in this list of options on the right. These are all the things you can do to uh, interact with other alien species. We can try to improve relations with them. Maybe we don't want them to be hostile towards us. We, we want to try to make up for what's happened between our two empires. We could choose the improve relations action and we could actually assign as many of these people as we'd like to, to really try to improve relations with our neighbors. This is where the freedom in Solaris comes to tell your own story, right? If you wanna be friends with the authoritarian fanatic xenophobes next door and you really wanna put your full effort into that, technically you can do that if you'd like to. Uh, we could build a spy network with this empire. And in so doing, we can find out, you know, what is their fleet power compared to ours? What is their technological level compared to ours? What is their economy compared to ours? And also, what does their empire even look like? Because right now we can't see the full extent of their borders. If you're up against a 
particularly aggressive opponent, building a spy network, first thing, is a very, very strong strategic move. So I'm going to put Clara on this, as she was the first person to find out about these aliens. She will also end up being our spy master for them. And we can see the effort that Clara is doing, or Clara is doing, in the espionage pane at the bottom. This looks rather scant, because right now I am not using the Nemesis DLC to show you this tutorial. But if you install the Nemesis DLC, buy and install it, you will have access to a ton of different operations. Things like finding new agents and sleeper agents inside of their territories or sparking a rebellion against their own empire. I love, I love the espionage and the nemesis elements that are added in that DLC. I wouldn't say it's the first DLC I recommend buying, but it's one of the top ones. So consider it if you're looking for something new to pick up because it gives you a lot of options. But what Clara is going to do as our spy master, she's going to build the infiltration level and our intel on our enemies. And this is going to give us information about their economy, their technology power, and their fleet power in relation to our own. Very important to do. Now, we could of course declare war day one, but you'll notice that if we do that, we don't actually have any war goals set. I'll explain that in our next, uh, our, our, our next episode. But there are a whole bunch of options that we can do to, in, to engage with this species. We can even just send them an insult. In fact, let's just do that. We'll send them an insult, greatly reducing their opinion of us. Boom, you've been insulted, deal with it. And their, uh, their opinion of us has decreased by even more because we've done that. You can use insults to sort of goad your opponents into offensive wars. One thing worth noting about that, as the, uh, as the defender in a war, you have a couple of advantages that allow you to defend your territory a little bit better than they allow you to attack. So you might use that as a tool in your arsenal diplomatically to goad your opponents into, a, into an offensive war where they have a little bit less of an advantage than you do. And in so doing, you could potentially kind of complete a bunch of your war goals without being the aggressor, which is kind of a little, little nasty little way of, of, of nipping at people. You can also do things like offer trade deals. And if this were an empire that actually wanted to engage in trade with us, they aren't. But if it were, we could trade them resources. We could get a variety and give a variety of, of, of benefits to them as well. We can trade for things like, I'm not gonna talk about favors. We could trade for things like their communications, which is what other alien species out in the galaxy have you met? We would love to meet them too. Could we have their, could we have their number please, right? Uh, or we could get an active sensor link, which is we would be able to see from their view, all of their systems and everything that they see, all of their ships, their line of sight, everything. Active sensor link is really powerful to get from your allies, but you'll notice that when we add these into this list here, we've got this number, which determines how likely it is, not likely, whether they will accept it or not. This is like one or done. It's not a percentage chance. It is, if it is a positive number, they'll accept. If it's a negative number, they will decline. And you'll notice that just by adding active sensor link, they have negative 1000 trade acceptance. They hate us. If an empire is hostile with you, you cannot trade with them. They will not do it. You could probably try to give them uh, a, a whole bunch of resources. They won't even accept it for that. You'll notice we would give them every single one of their of our alloys and they still will not give us active sensor link. I don't think, if I remember correctly, oh, you know what? No, uh, they will even trade with you at all because you have hostile relations. Even for 1500 alloys for one energy credit, they will not take that trade. They'll take it for free, of course, but they won't take it for anything else. Now, they'll take it for free. And this is one of the other ways that you can make a hostile empire a little bit less hostile to you by giving them sort of like, you know, a, a tribute and saying, here, please take these alloys, please. We don't want to be, we don't want to be enemies. We would love for you to take this. I wouldn't do this, this is a terrible idea, but you could do it and you can play around with this a little bit. 
uh, if when you're playing your game. With any other species in the game, we would be able to trade with them, no problem, and we can make trades for resources, we can make trades of systems that are adjacent to one another. Uh, in fact, just to piss them off a little bit, I'll just say, you're going to give us your Yakuri, like just, please, like we'll, we'll, we'll take it for free. That'd be, that'd be really nice. And just like the other notifications in the game, you will get notifications up top that say whether they accept or decline your trades. And similarly, you will get uh, announcements here that say, hey, you know, this empire would like to trade with you. Uh, they declined, which is too bad. I was hoping that they would give us that system for free, but they're not going to do it. So we have now an aggressive empire on our borders, and we've seen a few of the ways that we can engage with them. But let me show you one of the most powerful ways to engage, especially with a hostile empire, and that is by harming relations. And that seems a little bit counterintuitive, like why actively harm your relations with an empire in order to get something? Well, something that you'll get is actually very powerful. There are a whole bunch of ways that you can interact with empires that are grayed out. And if something is grayed out in this list, it's because you don't fulfill the requirements for it. Most of the positive interactions diplomatically are grayed out because you need to have either neutral or excellent relations, or you can really quickly just bypass that by assigning an envoy to improve relations. And just by assigning Koharu, we can improve our relations with them and we would have access to these. I don't wanna do that because the alternative is actually much better for us, which is to declare a rivalry. Now, we don't have terrible relations, we have hostile relations, but we can jump to be able to declare a rivalry by harming relations with this empire. So I'll have Paula be one of our, uh, our envoys to harm relations with the enlightened kingdom of the Spurk Ta. And now by doing that, we have the option to declare a rivalry. Why this is so valuable is because it will generate for us 0.5 influence per month. At the very beginning of the tutorial in episode one, I explained how influence is an incredibly valuable resource, but you can't really generate it very easily. You don't build buildings, you can't you know, build it on planets. There are very, very, very few ways to generate it. You generate it through rivalries and through power projection, which I'll explain in the next episode. But through rivalries, we can increase this and actually increase it quite a bit, right? We're basically increasing it by, what, one sixth of our existing influence, which is a huge bonus. So I'm going to go ahead and declare a rivalry against the Spear Kata. And now you'll notice we even are rivaling each other because of that. Both of us have an increase to our influence cost. And that is so, so, so important for what comes next. And you know I'm gonna tease you because we're gonna check that out in the next episode where we're gonna talk about warfare. I have had such positive feedback from this. Thank you so freaking much for watching. I think this is the second to last of our main episodes for the tutorial series. And I would like to do one episode after that if we get enough questions in the comments uh, where I'll do an FAQ and we'll talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what are those kind of burning questions that I haven't answered during the series that you would like an answer to. Maybe the little stuff that we can just kind of throw in there so you can be really prepared for your games of Solaris. If you have any questions about the game, maybe from the tutorial series, or maybe because you've just been playing and you've got some questions, let me know down in the comments. Let me know what you'd like to hear during that FAQ session, and we will cover that in two episodes from now. So the next one will be Warfare, and then after that will be our kind of big ol' wrap-up and FAQ. Thank you so much for watching. If you're enjoying, don't forget to like, subscribe, let your friends know about the tutorial. I've been hearing that some of you have actually been passing it along to different people, and that just like is the greatest praise. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And thanks for the support. Hope to see you all in our next episode, our last really big one, which is all about warfare in Solaris. And until then, take care.